Good morning, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. I'm running on a decent amount of sleep today. I had a client last night that went later than I expected it to. Went till like uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock p.m. my time. And uh, slept beautifully. Still woke up at like 3.30 a.m. this morning because that's just what I'm freaking wired to do. And, uh, you know, was lost myself in the computer for hours. And then all of a sudden I get an alert and I'm like, oh, 15 minutes to office hours. <laughs> so off we go over to this. Jedi Mind Gorilla, good morning, sir. G. Joe Carroll, first time Twitchy and subscriber. It's kind of funny, it, like doing this on a regular timed basis, like Wednesday and Thursday mornings, makes it easier for people to go, oh, okay, I know at this time I'm going to drop in. And it's always neat to see the viewership gradually go up, up, and up as I do the regular Twitch streams. I don't know if I'm going to do it through the fall. There's a, uh, uh, in late August, early September, there's like a three, four week period. Good morning, James. Good morning, Ashish. George, oh, that's what it is. Um, there's like a three, four week uh, period where I fly to Iceland for a few days, uh, fly to Oslo for Data Saturday Oslo, fly or uh, take a train to uh, Norway, to Gothenburg, no, so Oslo, Norway, Gothenburg, Sweden. I think I got those right. Uh, to do a data Saturday, Gothenburg, and then I do a like a uh, five day cruise up and down the uh, Norway coastline. Uh, good morning, Jim, and good morning, SQL Pilot as well. Uh, so there's like a three or four week period there where I won't be able to do office hours live. I'm actually excited to bring my camera gear with me so that I can do my, go back to stream, uh, recording office hours from uh, all over just gorgeous locations. That'll be a whole lot of fun. Um, the Iceland trip is going to be kind of interesting because I'm taking a camper van this time. Going really low, you know, low tech, old school, uh, and renting a camper van at the airport and then driving around for a few days in the countryside. I've seen like students do it all the time on YouTube videos. You see people like go around Iceland in five days in a camper van. That's idiotic because there's so much to see along the way. You're only going to see the highways. Uh, but there are a couple of highlights that I wanted to go back and see this time in a camper van just to kind of see what that experience is like. I don't expect to like it, but it should be a whole lot of fun. Uh, Ashish says, do you record your driving every time? No, definitely not. Because um, <laughs> a lot of times I... I don't necessarily uh, comply with speed regulations. Um, I, I'm a really safe driver. I have, knock on wood, never been in an accident that was my fault. I have been rear-ended by people while I was stationary, like sitting at the side of the road due to a storm or whatever and been hit, uh, but never been in an accident my uh, my fault, which is kind of awesome. But I, I will say I don't always obey speed regulations. So let's go take a look at the questions that y'all have in the queue. We'll do some of the high voted ones first, then we'll come back. Oh, I got I got to record the, the questions that I'm taking. We'll do the uh, high voted ones first, then we'll switch over and hit the most recent ones. First off, we have sick of Dell EMC says, Brent, is there a backup product you can recommend? I'll, I'll stop right there and say no. For me personally, I break it down into two categories. I love doing native backups, meaning just saying backup database and go use compression right to a network share. But that doesn't scale well when you go past, say, 100 gigabytes. And you could certainly make it work, but you could go higher than that. But personally, at around 100 gigabytes, I start asking about questions like, okay, what's our long-term backup strategy? How are we going to make restores as quick as possible? Then once you go out into third-party land, my favorite personal use is SAN snapshots. But of course, that depends so much on the exact SAN make SAN making model that you use. I wouldn't feel qualified to recommend one product over another because I don't usually have the sway to get companies to choose their exact storage type. Usually they've already bought the storage, made that investment by the time it comes to me. So I just have to deal with whatever I've been dealt. Uh, next up, one eyebrow raised says, I'm noticing three significant shortfalls in always on, and I assume you mean always on availability groups. It says, number one, login synchronization is manual. Well, correct, because logins, where are they stored? Are they stored in the user database? No, in the user database is what availability groups sync back and forth. 
Two, scheduled jobs. Where are scheduled jobs stored? They're also not stored in the user database. So I'm noticing a significant shortfall. You're complaining about things that aren't protected inside user databases, so always on availability groups doesn't work. Third, stored procs put in system databases. You shouldn't be doing that. You can put DBA utility stuff inside there, but nothing that end users access should be inside system databases. So do you know of any tools to address these shortcomings? Yes, if you need that, you picked the wrong technology. What you want is failover clustered instances instead and keep your grubby hands out of system databases. If you want to sync logins across servers, the easiest way to do that is with things like source control so that you do them once centrally and then you deploy them across all your servers or use active directory groups so that you're not having to add and remove individuals at the SQL Server level. Next up, Sean says, thanks in advance for roasting me. He says, we use dynamic SQL to loop through 200 plus columns to validate against a set of specs. What problem are we trying to solve here? Resulting in a lot of plans being painted when tuning. Is there a way to suppress benign executive pl or exec plans when looping through commands to reduce bloat? So first off, I'd ask what the problem is that you're trying to solve. But let's assume that the thing that you're doing, using dynamic SQL to loop through hundreds of columns, is valid. Like for some reason, you need it for a business perspective. Well, you just basically made the plan cache useless. You either have two choices. One is that you can use something other than the plan cache for monitoring, something like query store or a third party monitoring tool. Or, and I'm going to get roasted for this. Good morning, D. Sanchez. I'm going to get roasted for this, but you could put option recompile on those queries, and that'll keep them out of the plan cache. Now, of course, it comes with a giant drawback. Every time that the query runs, it's going to get compiled again from scratch. But if all these queries truly are different and they're not run all that often, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Whereas if they are very similar and they are run frequently, I'd step back and ask again what it is that the problem that we're trying to solve. All right, next up, uh, Albi Bach says, is data modeler still a career path or has that merged into database developer? Data modeler, at the end of the day, data modeler is really less about theoretical knowledge and it's more about practical what works for this business. Like, let's say your company has a chain of gas stations. The person who models the data probably needs to understand about the relationships between suppliers and uh, uh, individual stores and the different products that you sell and unusual discount packages or how you deal with truckers payments or how you keep the, I, I mean, I don't know, bathrooms clean, I suppose. There, there are a whole laundry list of things that are specific to the gas station industry that that data modeler may need to know. And even furthermore, specific to that chain of gas stations may do things a little bit different. So you may have someone in there called like an architect who understands a lot of those relationships. But it's fairly unusual that you see people go, I design tables for a living. If you design tables, you probably have to know the business so well. And you're not going to find that to be a career in the sense that you can pick up and hop to another company without relearning that business model from scratch. Uh, do you see any subspecialties in the database developer uh, field? Sure, tons. Your best bet there is if you want to start learning about what jobs are popping open out there, go to sites like Indeed or uh, your local whatever uh, you career recruiting type site that you prefer to go to. Or look at giant companies. Go to Microsoft, go to hospitals, hedge funds, manufacturing companies, and look at the kinds of jobs they're hiring. That'll tell you the specialties that are developing out there. 
I'm not saying you should use that to plan your own career. You should follow your dreams. Uh, George says, got to pause and get beer. Europe time. Oh, it's probably pretty late late over there. Uh, You know, follow your dreams. Do do what you're passionate about, and then you'll never work a day in your life. That's what they tell me. I work a whole lot. (laughs) Next up, Doug asks, do folks ask easily Googled questions intentionally? I, I tell you, so a lot of times in office hours, I'll see questions that don't get voted very highly, and they are, like Doug says, very easy to Google, and, and the answers are fairly obvious in the first thing, uh, first page of Google results. And I think those people break down into two categories. One is they don't know how to use Google, and they don't have a great BS detector. I've had coworkers like that in the past where they really struggle. And I'm like, if you don't understand how to use Google, you're, you're really not going to do very well in IT. The other category of uh, things is I think that people that want to see their name on screen, that they want to ask a question and see their name and go, oh, that's my question. And I find that really endearing. I find that really cute uh, because somewhere somebody gets excited to see their name up on the screen, as you might. Doug, who knows, depending on who uh, uh, Doug is. So I kind of look at those in an endearing way, although I do roast the bejesus out of people all the time. And we'll take one more highly voted one before we switch to the recent ones that you all have uh, just posted in. Isaac said, you answered Rojo without, about using distributed AGs for version upgrades, saying, no, it's not a good idea because it's too much work to set up. We want to upgrade from 2019 to 2022. What upgrades reduce risk and downtime? So once you start dealing with architectures like you said you already have distributed availability groups, once you start dealing with architecture advice for systems so complex that they have AGs and DAGs, you're not going to find great free answers on the internet that respond within like 30 second sound bites. You're in the big leagues now. You're in the kind of complex, high velocity, <laughs> going parallel says my high velocity environment that you probably need hands on consulting. Good news. I know someone who does that. And I think you do too. Wink, wink. Next question, we have Mac Ferguson. Mac says, hey, Brent, one of the courses you mentioned using GUIDs as primary keys and clustered indexes, that they're not as bad as a choice as as DBAs make it out to be. If you go this route, are there any different best practices that you can recommend, fill factor or extra memory? Google for my name and fill factor, and you'll find... (laughs) Remember how just a second ago we were talking about easily answered questions uh, that you could Google? Your question is actually legit. This isn't like easily Googleable. If you type all this stuff out, you're not going to get to a great answer. But search for Brent Ozar fill factor, and I have several live video courses where I've gone through and shown you, and it's all completely for free, uh, where I walk you through how to think about fill factor. And that it's not usually the dial that people think is going to save their lives. Uh, next up, Jedi Mind Grill says, I always tell people that I'm not the kind of guy who can code a cup of coffee from zero. I'm the kind of guy who makes it taste better. I am exactly in that role. My days of building new applications from scratch have long since passed. Uh, continues, is it common to have people looking for SQL jobs that may not have as much coding experience but are good at performance? It's rare at small companies. Imagine that you're a, a company with a slow SQL Server uh, application. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. Um, uh, to, uh, Eliferous, you'd go, or Eli uh, Ferris, make sure to hit the URL there for where the questions go. Uh, it's, it's very rare that a company would say, our application is slow. Let's hire a stranger as a full-time employee. Typically, when a company's apps are slow, they want quick response time, and they probably don't want it full time. They think about it as something that's going to be able to be turned around in a short period of time, so they hire consultants. Uh, So it's very common to find people who do that as consultants. It's less common to find job postings for it. It is common to find people who actually do it, 
but they do it for the company that they already work for. Like they'll go to work for some ginormous company or maybe your company as a full-time employee, as a DBA or as a developer, and then they gradually segue into that performance tuning role. But you, you never see like help wanted ads for it. I've had clients who do it. I've had clients who hire, uh, you know, where I've said, okay, look, you have to have somebody focus on performance right now. And I've helped them craft the ad and then they post the ad. But it's so rare that a company would just decide on their own that they need that. Something slow in your neighborhood. Um, Sammy says, an architect that I know likes to default every primary key uh, is an integer with the max negative number to avoid resizing. Is it brilliant or needlessly clever? It's fairly common amongst people who do a lot of data modeling. In most cases, it's overkill. Most shops will never uh, exhaust positive integer or big integer spaces, but it doesn't hurt. It's pretty harmless in the grand scheme of things. Plus, that pro person probably thinks they're brilliant and they keep patting themselves on the back for it. Everyone should feel good about it, like Sammy or should feel good about themselves for some reason or another. For example, Sammy, you smell terrific today. Good job on using deodorant. You did, you did quite well. Accidental DBA says, can we run multiple backups on a single server as we have 100 plus databases? Can we run multiple backups? I wonder if there's a way that we could find that answer out. I wonder if it's possible that an application might be able to run two different queries in two different tabs. If only there was some way to test this. Accidental DBA, unfortunately, there is just no way to know an answer like that. You'll probably need to go to a website like rentozar.com or brentozar.com, perhaps. Click Consulting at the top of the screen, pay thousands of dollars, and the nice, handsome gentleman will be able to answer that question for you. Or you could open up SQL Server Management Studio or Azure Data Studio and try it. Type backup database in two different windows on two different databases and get your answer. One of my favorite pieces of advice came from Paul Randall early on when I was working with Paul Randall over at SQL Skills. I worked for him briefly, I don't know, it's like six months or something. I love them to death. Paul and Rand, Paul Randall, Kimberly Tripp, Jonathan Hyas, they're brilliant people, lots of fun. Um, and uh, one of the best things that Paul ever taught me was before you ask a question, if the question that you write out, if you say, okay, for in the same amount of space as me writing out this question, I could also write the test to do it, don't ask the question. Because when someone gives you an answer, you should probably test it anyway, right? And if you can test it to get your answer in the same amount of time that it would take you to type the question, just go test it. Yes, you can use multiple backups on the same server. Yes, you say you use Ola Hollingren scripts. Ola Hollingren scripts even have something called documentation that tells you how to do that. So read the documentation and test. It is absolutely, positively doable. Uh, next up, Just Winging It says, in your experience, when you rebuild indexes and fragmentation is still present, what are the usual suspects to check? Please feel free to roast me. So if you search for Breno's R fragmentation, I've got videos out there, and, and, and often I'll tell people to stop rebuilding indexes, especially because things will continue to fragment very quickly, depending on what your index design looks like. And you're not really solving anything, and you're doing a ton of transaction log writes, making end user activity slower, and so forth. But most of the time when I hit this question, it's that somebody's rebuilding a very small object, and it's always going to have empty space on pages because the object is so incredibly tiny. That's why most index rebuild scripts will have a default parameter for the number of pages or size present in an object uh, before you bother rebuilding it when you get under like a couple few megabytes. It's just always going to be fragmented. Next up we have, uh, George says, have you encountered any new entry in your top five weight stats issues in the last few years? Um, weight stats, no. Issues, yes. Have I encountered any issues in newer versions of SQL Server? 
And you're really best off if you go to, this is going to sound like a smart alecky response, but it's actually good. Uh, if you go to brentozar.com, click blog up at the top, and there are categories for each SQL Server version. You can click on the version, and I, I tend to blog about every issue that I run into, and uh, I've got them out there on the blog, so you can hit them from there. Every unusual entrance in, uh, thing that I hit. My alarm watch is going off, which means it's time for us to run an ad break. It means that I've been chatting for quite a while here. Let's run a 90-second ad break, and then we'll come back and continue answering questions. Where's that magic button? There it is. And for those of you who are still with me and not seeing an ad, yay, you! I love you! You people are my subscribers because you subscribe over on Twitch, uh, and so you don't have to see ads. So we'll do a bonus question for y'all. Let's see here. A bonus question for y'all. Uh, Universe for Rent asks, I'm often tasked to review SQL code that's being about to be pushed into production. Are there any blog posts that talk about what DBA should look for when they're reviewing code? Yes, you want something called a linter. L-I-N-T-E-R, a linter. If you search for uh, SQL Server linter, you will find a bunch of pieces of code out there for you that actually focus on this exact task. Uh, they go through and look for common anti-patterns, things like select star. You may not prohibit select star. I don't really mind select star so much, and I talk about why in my training classes. Uh, but uh, you, you may be OK with some of the problems. Some of them you may take very seriously, but they're just a quick, easy, free way uh, to get a fast piece of advice on your T-SQL. People who do CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment, often do things like unit testing or uh, run the linter directly against uh, the application code that comes into GitHub or whatever their favorite application is, which will just give them a quick pass fail so that at the time that people do their check-ins, uh, they immediately know whether or not their code passes a basic sniff test. So that's a place where I would start. All right, let's come back over to here. Let's see, our next question, uh, Archibear asks, I've been working with SQL Server since 6.5. I'm working with a new team building an Azure setup from the beginning. Wondering if you have some suggestions on reading to get up to speed. Oh, so you're working with running SQL Server in the cloud, and you're wondering if there's something that you could learn. Good news, everyone. If you go to brentozar.com and click training up at the top, click training up at the top, and I have a whole uh, training course just around running SQL Server in the cloud. So you can go watch that. It's like, I want to say about 200 bucks, uh, way cheaper than an hour of your SQL Server bills. So that's uh, pretty useful. Next up, we have developer who cosplays as a DBA. <laughs> I resemble that remark. I totally got started that way. Uh, says, I, oh, let me make sure I have chat up too. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, the, uh, uh, says, I recently ran into compilation timeouts in a prod database that caused web pages to timeout, and I'd love to put a, together a demo of that for educational purposes. Do you have any tips on how you go, uh, go about intentionally writing a query with a long compile time? Yes. Google for Brent Ozar long compile time bad queries. And I have a blog post and a video on doing exactly that, where several years ago for Dell DBA days, I did exactly what you're talking about, wrote a query that took 12 plus hours in order to compile. I teach you how to do that with a numbers table. It's really simple. You can do it in a matter of minutes, and it's a whole lot of fun. Uh, next up, I've got Heaps asks, hypothetically, Brent decides to sell all of his cars to go fund a new database engine. What are your dream bells and whistles? Okay, so first off, I would never, ever do it because then I would have to support the database and end users are morons. I'm not talking about you. Obviously, you're handsome and good looking and you... Uh, 
just nothing but wonderful things to say about you. Uh, but I, I just would never want to build an application that people can install and I have to support. God, what a pain in the rear. I worked for Quest Software for a while, and, and I had friends in the support department, and I got to see how incredibly bad some of the, the customers were in terms of their ideas. Hi, I'm trying to run SQL Server on a Commodore 64. Can you tell me why this is wrong? Oh, God, sweet Jesus. Um, but I'll tell you what my like my personal favorite features are in databases. Multi-master replication, it should automatically be able to take writes across multiple nodes. As long as a minimum number of nodes are up in order to support a commit, you should be able to connect to any node and do a write and know with a quick consensus that your write is going to succeed. That's incredibly hard for conventional relational databases like SQL Server. It's much easier for more modern uh, relational databases. That's my big one uh, by far. Next up, uh, Peter asks, what's the largest server you've ever seen log shipped? Not individual servers, but uh, groups of servers. So I had one client who had 10 to 15,000 SQL Server databases that were all log shipped. Every time a client signed up on their website, they would automatically create a new database for that client and automatically protect it within, with log shipping within a matter of seconds. It was insane. Um, well, I mean, I, I say insane, but I mean, they're profitable. They did well doing it, but it, was, it took a lot of work. Uh, any issues with shipping large servers? In terms of a large number of databases, the problem with it is that if you think I'm going to run a log shipping job that loops through my databases one at a time, you're not going to be able to go through them fast enough and circle around to the beginning. The business isn't going to be happy with the lag time that it takes to go through all of them. So you have to uh, build something that can back up multiple log data, multiple log, multiple databases in different threads. That is why we wrote SP all night log all night. Uh, so Eric Darling and I were working for Kcura Relativity, which I can talk about that because we did a whole public thing about it, uh, uh, where they wanted to be able to log ship lots of databases uh, automatically and just define RPOs and RTOs and have the T-SQL automatically meet it for them. Um, so that, by far and away, the biggest problem is making sure you can loop through all the databases quickly enough and automatically pick up new databases on the other side as new databases are added. When their backups show up, you need to be able to recognize that it's a new database, restore it automatically, and get that log shipping going. It's pretty cool. Uh, next up, Core says, is there any easy way to detect SQL Server agent missed jobs? For example, if the agent is stopped due to an issue with the service, uh, server, or plan maintenance. Yeah, there are uh, job history tables in MSDB that will tell you when a job is scheduled and when it actually ran. Now, of course, it's up to you to go write those queries, but if you want to do that, the mechanics are all there for you there inside those tables. Uh, next up, Guilty DBA asks, is there a way to configure Query Store to handle identical plans more efficiently? What you mean by that is if you say select star from fans where creator equals Lady Gaga, and then you say select star from fans where creator equals Katy Perry, those are seen as two different queries to Query Store and to SQL Server itself. Now, your question's a little tricky. Is there a way to configure it to handle them more efficiently? For Query Store, that answer is that it will simply ignore those queries if you configure it that way. That handles them more efficiently in the sense that they won't clutter up Query Store, but then also you're not going to see the impact of those queries. And when I run into shops like this, they're like, we're looking at our monitoring dashboard. We're trying to fix these top queries, but there just nothing seems to be getting better. And the problem is that they're having this death by a thousand cuts scenario because the select star from fans query is the one that's really hammering the server. It's just that it doesn't show up at the top because it comes in as a brand new query every time. And unfortunately, query store is not going to be able to help you with that. 
Uh, let's see here. GP Geek says there are third-party software that can monitor Windows services in case the service fails. Yes, but the question that he had was about when it, the service comes back up, what do you do about the jobs that it missed when it was down? How do you detect which jobs it should have run? That's where it gets tricky. Uh, next up, Yevgeny asks, how far back in SQL versions does office hours go back? I don't remember the exact year, but I think that we started doing office hours. It was back in the ages of WebEx. I'm going to say it was maybe 2010, 2011. I'm not really sure. Um, has the format of it changed since then? Yes, it used to be WebEx. It used to be kind of our team meeting every week at on Wednesdays at like 10 a.m., something like that. Uh, everybody in the company, we all worked remotely. As many of us who weren't booked for consulting at that time or who could get away, we would all uh, show up in uh, WebEx at the same time and answer whatever questions people put in via WebEx. And it was really hard because like with the Twitch chat there, the questions would go streaming by. And so we would miss all kinds of questions and people would keep copy pasting in the same questions, trying to get us to notice them when we were trying to discuss something else. That was absolutely terrible, which is why I had Richie build PollGab, which is so much more efficient to help me uh, answer questions there. Jedi Mind Girl says, I just noticed the California sign. Yeah, that was a gift of mine uh, from a friend of mine, Mike, who's uh, very funny, has a fantastic sense of humor. He and I both adore California, and it's a line from a novel uh, that the, the kind of gist of it is, look, California is so wonderful that if anything bad ever happens there, it deserves what it gets, which is just amusing to me at least. Hadar asks, is there a good way to programmatically obtain the query hash or query plan hash of a query after its execution for auditing purposes? I don't think you want the query hash or query plan hash for auditing. Because those two things are only useful when the plan is up in cache. And if you're doing true auditing, you don't want to screw around with things that could disappear from the plan cache at any time. So I would question what it is that the problem that you're trying to solve. Tell me what the problem that you're trying to solve is and go from there, because I don't think that you really want to rely on something that has already disappeared from memory by the time the query completes. Next up, let's see, Eduardo says, how do you recommend implementing PROC debugging logging when the PROC could be running on an AG primary or secondary? Usually when we talk about debugging, print statements are pretty fantastic. But if you need to create tables and log the contents of tables, you have two options to do it. One would be table variables. The other would be temp tables. Either of those can be written even on an AG secondary. If you're trying to log to a place uh, for as the stored procedure runs, you want every execution of it to write to a log somewhere. What you want to do is have a log database on every node that is not in the availability group. Then you can write to it on any node. It'll always have a local log DB that you can write directly to. Then you can go research in that node whatever the log records were. Hopefully that explains that well. Uh, Ren, oh, Ren, good to see you. Uh, Ren says, hi, Brent. Do you think a noted 2019 query performance might be patched anytime soon? No. Uh, I would be pretty shocked if it did. The folks that I knew at Microsoft who interacted with me after that went live was like, no, it's not true. It's expected behavior processors have gotten faster over the years. And all of that is true. The, the problem that my client ran into was that they were running a state-of-the-art server up in Azure, the fastest cores that they could get, as many cores as they could get. They went from 2016 on that hardware to 2019 on an identical VM type, and they were right up against the limits of load testing uh, already on 2016, and that 3% knocked them down to the point where they couldn't compete they couldn't make that workload work up in Azure on exactly the same hardware. Uh, Eliferous uh, asks a follow-up question. Read-only on AGs can have temp table log actions written on it as well, or does it have to be read-write? What did we say earlier about testing? Remember what we said about that? If you can write the test in the same amount of time it would take you to write the question, Get up off your lazy, pimply, ugly, unwiped rear end and go do it. Thank you. 
probably hit a few close to home for a little few folks. And then we'll take one more. Uh, Jessica asks, hi, Brent. I'm going to be in Vegas for a tech conference in about a month. What's a good local restaurant or coffee shop that's amazing to go to and away from the touristy areas? For me, Spring Mountain Road. Spring Mountain Road is this road pretty close to the Strip uh, that's Chinatown. The food is unbelievable. There are so many good restaurants on Spring Mountain Road. So if you Google for uh, Las Vegas Spring Mountain Road best restaurants, there are going to be a laundry list of Chinese places. Um, One of them that I like a lot is Zhao Long Soup Dumplings. Zhao Long is spelled X-I-A-O or X-A-I-O, something like that, long soup dumplings. Some of the best soup dumplings I've ever had in my life. Right across the street from that, there is a shopping market called Shanghai Plaza. Um, It has a store in there called the Manga Hole manga hole it is a japanese comic uh, place uh, that specializes in uh, mangas and in that same shopping center i don't i don't do mangas at all i just find the name of a store manga hole to be really funny in that same shopping center there are a bunch of great restaurants that, and all of this stuff is cheap as i'll get out it's really cheap and really good those are those are my favorites there um, oh, there's been one more. Uh, GP Geek says, how do you get more than 4K or 8K into an Envercare or Vercare variable? Max. Envercare Max or Vercare Max. Uh, so that is how you get more data than that. You put in, just like you would create Envercare 4000, say, for example, put in Envercare Max in there, all M-A-X, just like it sounds. Uh, and then you can put gigabytes worth of data inside there. All right, there we go. That is the question queue for today. For tomorrow's office hours, uh, I believe I'm going to be working on the first responder kit, doing live coding and debugging and troubleshooting in there, uh, because I'm about to release the next version, the next month's version of that. I've actually been coding uh, uh, stuff in the first responder kit and checking in my work without running the code. I was uh, working yesterday with a client that was doing high concurrency troubleshooting shooting and I couldn't change SB Blitz first in their office like on their systems I wasn't allowed to change anything live so I was making changes to SB Blitz first thinking that I'm cha- uh, fixing things I don't even know if it compiles I was just checking in my source code and then we'll see if the stuff actually compiles and works uh, tomorrow so thanks uh, glad oh um, SQL pilot says Musashi Musashi Steakhouse had the best food I've ever had I have not been there I haven't even heard of it but the thing with uh, Vegas is that there's so many great restaurants it's just truly unbelievable I absolutely love coming uh, here all right well thanks for hanging out with me today and I will see you tomorrow morning same time on the next office hours adios